Could you please tell me your name? Yes, my name is uh, Steve Swanson, and um, we're here today to talk about uh, how we as a community uh, plan and, and implement solutions for the future of our kids in education through the campus level site-based decision making, and uh, also uh, briefly about what we as a community can do coming together. So that's why we're here. We're going to get into your experiences about the some of the breakdowns in site-based planning in AISD. Yes. Okay. Before we get into that, why don't you introduce yourself briefly and talk about your professional background. Um, I'm a uh, licensed uh, professional uh, structural engineer, currently inactive. Uh, I've been a partner in helping uh, create and, and run and grow a, a business. It was a construction management business, which... Uh, led me into becoming involved not only in uh, private sector construction, but a lot of public sector construction and design. And uh, most of that was in education, and most of that in K through 12. Um, I've taught at, at the university level in the School of Architecture, uh, engineering, and uh, surveying, and uh, drafting which today is catting, and uh, I have uh, a great deal of community experience here in Austin and in other uh, areas of Central Texas in uh, focusing on helping improve education. I've been a Workforce Development Board member uh, for 12 years. I was on the Community Action Network, which is a combination of city, county, school district, workforce, board, uh, nonprofits, uh, and in some cases businesses talking about how to improve our community. Was on that for 10 years. Um, and I've been, been in, involved in a variety of youth activities when my young men were growing up, so I have been a coach and, and uh, an organizer of youth sports and have become a community advocate today to help us truly work together for our kids. Tell me about how you uh, first got involved with AISD, where it began, and what sorts of things you've done. Uh, my involvement with AISD started in the mid-90s. Uh, we built buildings for them, uh, introduced a partnering process, which is a community building process to help uh, build trust and uh, engage in problem solving and problem prevention, and, and uh, all for the purpose of uh, not going to court and being productive. And that was in the mid-90s, built a variety of structures for them. Um, I have uh, uh, constantly been involved uh, in my community work here in Austin in connection with uh, school board members and as well as other elected officials. And uh, about five years ago, um, it became clear to me that in order to meet the needs of our kids, we're going to have to truly work together as a community. So. I left the, the private world and engaged in volunteering and has spent a great deal of time um, in East Austin, uh, which is, I guess you would call our at-risk area. What I discovered, it, that's where our potential lies when you really get to meet the kids. Um, and um, been on uh, CACs at the uh, Eastside Memorial at Johnston starting in 2011, and before that uh, was part of a, just being a community volunteer uh, in and around that area. And that actually started in 2008 at Eastside Memorial where we had a community event. People from all of the city came, and uh, the results of that event led to people being inspired from the justice system and from the community to change youth justice in our city. So that journey continues, and we're moving from a sense of blame and punishment and ticketing and scolding into what now I'm, I'm going to say is where the more mature state is youth leadership where we're actually allowing them to be their own solutions and encouraging them in that. So Steve, in, in the course of your involvement with AISD, you have become familiar with what the Texas Education Code says about how site-based planning should operate at school campuses. Correct? Correct. Tell me about that. Well, it was about three or four years ago, a friend of mine actually started quoting one or two sentences of the code, and I've been reading it now for oh, two or three years. Studying it might be a better way to put it. And 
there, it is profound. It's in chapter 11, the governance provisions of chapter 11 that have to do with community-based leadership. And it unfolds under engaging, uh, basically, board members are responsible for effective, ensuring effective campus-level site-based decision-making. What that means is planning and decision-making. What that means is the planning and the deciding and the engaging of serving the needs of our kids takes close. It takes, it takes place close to the school, not downtown, which is what we currently are living under. And the other, the other part of the code, which I've actually shared now with, uh, with legislators and others, uh, is, uh, I'll mean, be specific, 11.1511B1, the school board shall seek working relationships with other public entities to make effective use of community resources to serve the needs of all public school students. Those are profound. Those are profound provisions that we don't live in right now. So one of the things you just said was that planning should take place close to the campus. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Well, the provisions of the code actually uh, designate that you have teachers and parents and community members and business representatives on a, on a committee called the Campus Level Planning and Decision Making Committee, which at AISD they call the CACs. This is a group of people who are supposed to assess and understand student needs and, and focus on creating, a, creating and understanding ways to meet those needs and actually help nurture, um, nurture impl implementation of those ways. And it also calls for a systematic approach to fully engaging the rest of the community so the community is aware of, knows about, and is alerted to what, what kind of planning is going on and what that would do is sensitize them to how they might be able to help. And the planning process itself should actually engage them as well. Why is that important? The, uh, the solutions um, that we, we need to serve our young younger people and our children are going to need to come from wherever we can find the resources. And I'm convinced that the most important resource in any neighborhood for any child is the neighbor, is the parent, is the people across the street. Um, and, and we have to inspire people to actually meet challenges where they're at. We're not going to be able to buy any buy solutions. We're not going to be able to hire somebody to come in and do something for people it won't sustain it. We have to be able to learn how to do things ourselves close to where our kids are. Some communities will struggle in that. And that's where the importance of having a bigger picture of Austin is, is because, and I've actually experienced it, where people uh, from one side of town are willing to help and come alongside people from another side of the town in order to help them do for themselves. Now, and that's, that's, the eventual, that's the hope in the future. Steve, this model for drawing the community in to help solve its own problems, that resonates with you in part because of your experiences uh, in the private sector. Correct. Tell me more about that. Well, uh, I, in the late 80s, um, we were given a contract to oversee the management uh, of the design and construction of a major federal facility. Four months into it, I knew I needed to learn something, so I went to a conference and I sat next to a colonel in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who I was hoping was going to be my mentor. Uh, he was a commander of the Northwest District of the, for the country, and I told him the challenges I were having, and he said, have you heard of partnering? And I go, no, what's that? He says, well, uh, before you start to do anything, you have people get together and get to know each other and talk about how you want to build trust and talk about how you want to communicate and collaborate talk about what's going to happen when you deal with problems, how you can effectively do that close to the, close to the problem, not downtown or not, not with the attorney. And uh, also put a lot of time and energy into identifying problems to prevent. So I, I was excited. It was it spoke to me 10 minutes and I started reading about it, came back and started sharing it. And, uh, and one of the stories is uh, for, for the first K through 12 project we did it on, I um, shared it with, um, some of the leaders from a school district, the assistant superintendent and the head of facilities, and we successfully built buildings for them before in the old way. But I introduced this, and uh, it was privileged that I only had to talk for about a minute. They heard what it was about, and then I listened to them talk about how this is the way they wanted to do things. So I didn't have to sell it. They were on top of it in a second. 
So we went through the steps, we went through the workshops, we went through the sessions, we, we created um, the ways to communicate how we're doing and to evaluate ourselves. And uh, at the end, uh, 12, approximately 12 month project, I uh, was actually asked by a friend of mine uh, if we could make a presentation for the Council of Facil uh, Fac CEFPI, Council for Education of Facility Planners International, which was just starting back then. And I said, sure. So a bunch of adults got up, and about eight of us, and we shared our story. And the, each one of us, in some way or another, talked about how much they enjoyed each other, how much they enjoyed getting to work, that we solved problems. And um, that it was, it, was, it was a positive experience for everybody, and, which is the goal. But after the session was over, we were commingling out with you know a group of us, and I heard a superintendent, the superintendent of the school district comment to a retired superintendent and said the following: Not only did the process have a positive impact on them, in that case that was the adults, it had a positive impact on our students, teachers, and parents. And at that moment, I knew it was no longer about time schedules for buildings. It was no longer about getting the door in the right place, the building the right color. It was all about changing the lives of our kids and discovered in that moment, we don't have really uh, a student uh, behavior challenge. We have an adult behavior opportunity. And so that, that process that you're talking about that had those positive results involved bringing more people to yes. the table for the job. Yes. Just tell me briefly about how, what that looked like. Uh, well, in a, in a project of that nature, you have engineers and architects and school administrators and, and uh, you have carpenters and iron workers and laborers. You have a, a very diverse group of people that all have very specific talents. And uh, when you engage them in looking at what's to be done together, you get a lot more wisdom and insight into what the solution could be or should be than if you just have one or two people draw something up and hand it to other people. And, and not only did it inspire more creative solutions and more productive solutions, it actually got people to talk, together, talk with each other and communicate with one another. So when they're out doing the work and they had a problem, they solved it. As opposed to needing to fill out a form, call downtown, uh, get permission. And so it, it empowered people and it, gave, it, it created trust and they also learned that if a problem, uh, we actually talked about it early, that if a problem can't be solved by those at the front line, don't be timid, ask for help. Now, that was, that's huge considering the context of what we're experiencing at AISD. To have a teacher and a student or an administrator and a teacher ask for help from their superior, wanting it, and appreciating it, uh, it's, it's unique if it exists at all. So uh, that was the story. Well, I think that pre presents a really good segue. Uh, let's fast forward to your involvement with uh, Eastside Memorial at Johnston and being on the Campus Advisory <clears throat> Council. Now, one of the things that the, the CAC is responsible for is uh, developing a campus improvement plan. Correct. Tell me about what uh, a CIP is. Well, CIP is a plan of objectives and a plan of tasks and a plan of responsibilities in order to identify and meet the needs of children. And uh, it's a, to be a planning document. I spent a lot of time uh, around the group at Eastside Memorial Johnston, not formally on the CAC, but in 2011 with the new principal. He reached out to me and asked me to be the community representative. And I was hopeful at that point in time that I'd participate in planning for the kids on that campus. And the Texas Education Code talks about that CIP planning process being very uh, very much located at the campus itself, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Tell me more about that. Well, it, it, it speaks to involvement of teachers, uh, parents, uh, community members, and even business representatives. And um, it, it speaks to identifying needs, understanding needs, and for that group of people to uh, help create solutions. Now the power in that group of people helping create solutions is they become part of implementing them. And actually the solutions are gonna be much, much more enlightened and inspired than something given from downtown. Um, 
and the pro it's supposed to be a process. And at Eastside Memorial, I never saw it happen, and I did not get to participate in it. You say you never saw it happen. What right. what did happen? The um, well, I was there in 2010, 2011. I participated in uh, youth leadership activities and others, which I hope we speak to early, uh, later. But um, um, the new soup, the new we had a new principal because they uh, this district went for, uh, decided to go from two high schools to one high school. Imagine that um, it makes sense to. Anyway, uh, two or three years earlier, they decided to go to two high schools. Again, downtown solutions, not engaging the people in the problem and therefore having to change it again right away. Uh, and so they went from two to one and therefore they had to get a new principal. They uh, went on a principal search. Uh, the students uh, wanted their principal from one of those campuses, previous campuses. They didn't get him. They got a, another principal who came in from out of town, wasn't familiar with Austin. And eventually, you could tell, and he he even said he wasn't suited for this campus. And uh, in that whole process, there was one meeting where he had sat down and showed us, handed a piece of paper to us, and said, "This is the this is the plan I did." Did the campus advisory committee uh, give input to or help draft the campus improvement plan at that school? No. Tell me about how the CIP actually came into existence. The principal did it. And then I had read uh, eight, nine, ten months earlier a plan that supposedly the district had created to do with TEA, and I pointed out to him that his plan didn't have in it had stuff in it that the other plan did, and he took it back and he says, "Oh, I'll go fix it." Tell me about downtown's role, as far as as far as you could tell from what you saw and what you heard. Tell me about what the role downtown had in creating that CIP. Um, well, at that point. I didn't know. I mean, I was learning. I was I was interested in a community-based process of planning for the school. Was there to help, but I didn't know what what went on to create the real plan. Other than uh, the principal handed me a piece of paper uh, or pieces of papers, uh, no budget, just some chart, a little a matrix. Um, and at that point, I really I had no deep understanding of of downtown's involvement. That didn't happen until the end of the 2011-2012 school season when, because of myself, I went down and said, when's the planning going to happen? I'm not involved in any planning. This is the end of the school year. And uh, the head of the schools told me to call a consultant. <laughs> they, he didn't know what was going on. Call a consultant. I, two or three days later, I get an emergency email from one of the parents saying we got to have a planning meeting. And this is towards the end of the spring semester. And I'm not sure what it ever started had I not gone down to the office and sat and said, when are we going to start planning for this school? And uh, then we did start meeting, couple small group meetings uh, with the consultant. And, uh, and right on, early on, uh, we were alerted that AISD has multiple plans. They don't always align with each other. Somebody even said six to eight different plans that would impact one school. And they don't align with each other. It's hard to figure them all out. And then they also said, now you got to understand that there's people down in cubicles downtown writing these plans. And then somebody else said, and they don't care for the kids. So it was real quickly to see that plan writing is done downtown, and maybe the principal picks it up and helps out. But for five, six, seven, eight, nine months, ask for process on how this, how how the district goes through this. They couldn't, they couldn't describe a process, other than people writing it downtown or a principal writing it and handing it to people. So the campus improvement plan, which is supposed to be drafted on the campus, mm -hmm. in your experience, was actually drafted downtown and imposed upon the campus. Well, I wouldn't even say drafted. It was finished downtown and shown to the campus. And this isn't how things should operate under the education code? Uh, no, nor common sense. You said a moment ago, transitioning to a new topic, you said a moment ago that you hoped you could speak about your experience with youth leadership mm -hmm. on campus. Tell me about uh, 
what your first experience was with youth leadership at the, the Eastside Memorial at Johnston campus. Um, well, the first experience was 2009, 2010, 2010, 2011, some, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, my, my friend who uh, lives over there and, and has a son that goes to school there came to me one day and said, uh, Steve, I'm concerned about my son. He, he, I don't know what he's doing at night. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm raw. I don't know what's going on. Uh, he's, and Saturdays he's gone. I said, well, what's going on? Well, well he's involved in this, this robotics thing. And I, I said, I'm bewildered. He's in school all night and all Saturday. And, and I went, whoa. So I went around the campus. And so the next day I, I saw a parent. And I said, where's this robotics stuff? Oh, she, oh, she brings me over and she shows me the, uh, the robotics class. And I walked by the room where they have the tools and the machines that help them do and build things. And then I walked into the class, another room with computers that, was, that had students in it and had, had uh, what I'm calling coaches from a business uh, in the room and they're just a ton of energy and they're, they're focused on designing and, and, and then I saw it, an instructor and I walked into something that I would, I hope every child would yearn for. <clears throat> People from the business community with instructors involved in creating and doing something to build something or to learn something and doing it together as a team and I started to investigate it. And the, the robotics teams, they, they create their own leadership models. They have their own responsibilities on those teams. It's kind of like a, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a team. And they all have different responsibilities. And they, and they can speak to them. The one's in charge of the, uh, the, the electronics. Another one's in, don't hold me this exactly. And the other one's in, in charge of building the, the frame. Another one's in charge of the programming, the software. And, oh, it's just awesome. And so uh, I thought it was profound and it hit me within seconds. And what I eventually saw was it was children, or not children, in these cases, young people being lifted up, helped to be in a position where they're contributing to designing and creating and moving forward themselves. And the adults were sitting around them, not over them. Why does that excite you? Because uh, the students themselves had energy. The students themselves admitted to enjoying it. The students themselves talked about learning. And the business representatives who were there, who were engineers, they were excited too. Now the real excitement, the real deep excitement, it comes from the fact that I then, then wanted to hear the story. Where did this come from? How did this happen? It didn't happen from anything that happened downtown. Absolutely just the opposite. A, a teacher in a West Austin school wanted to find a better way. Struggled, searched, yearned. Boy, if you listen to his story, boy, it really gets set off. Because I went and talked to him and I said, you need to have your story on video. Anyway, and then it, it came onto this robotics world that had been been created and and then and then a business so you have an educator yearning to do things to empower kids and get them excited a business who then came alongside them and I we later talked to the vice president of that business and his opening statements were now you mustn't understand we don't do this just because we're nice people we do this because of enlightened self-interest the business community really revealing that doing this kind of thing serves them and their community is huge. It, it takes away this whole sense of, oh, you just got to be nice. No, you got to be productive. You got to be involved. And then they reached out and searched for a way to engage with the students in order to help the students become successful. And they heard about this robotics program. The template for the robotics program is a campfire of serious people for serious purpose. That resonated with me because the partnering workshops mm. were creating the campfire. The seriousness was, yes, we're going to get something done. Did we have purpose? Yeah, we had to get something done. But I experienced that campfire. A circle, mm -hmm. which is now a metaphor for any sort of community building environment in terms of people sitting. Light and energy through the fire. And most of us associate a campfire with celebration. 
So, uh, boom. And then the real power came when the West Austin High School came to the East Austin High School. My friend said his son's life has changed because of it. A year later, one of the coaches from the, from the company passed away from two or three really serious diseases, but he, he, had, he had done the best with his life that he could do. He was a model for living life with what you have. Um, I can't remember him. It was a combination of leukemia and multiple sclerosis or something. It was sad. But I went to the memorial service for this young coach, 20, 30, 20 to 30s, in West Austin. Actually, way West Austin, out on Highway 620. And in front of me, in that memorial service, were at least 15 students from East Austin. Now, how often do you find people from North, from West and East Austin celebrating life like that together? It happens occasionally, but for me, that was deep and it was profound. And it started with a teacher and an inspired business leader. Tell me about the impact that downtown ultimately had on that program. Well, its impact uh, would have to be considered, at best, negative. Uh, that did not nurture it. Uh, I was actually told by a board member that you had to do it underground. You don't want downtown to know about these things. Actually told that, I was told that. Um, and um, when uh, the, the robotics experience and the students, really not, the students themselves were celebrated by the media after having not celebrated the kids, um, you never heard of anybody from downtown participating in the celebration. I have yet to hear a board member, a superintendent, or an assistant superintendent celebrate these kids transforming their lives this way and the business. Uh, it just doesn't and they're That's not why they're there. They're there for, I don't know, good question. But they're, there, they're not fully engaged with the students. Speaking, understanding the students. Speaking of the which, speaking of understanding the students, during this process while you were involved with the, this these, this youth leadership at the, the campus. The discussion about the idea charter uh, came on to the scene. Tell me what the, the, the young people's response or reaction to that discussion was. Well, first of all, they, uh, they had felt, which I personally felt as well, ignored, discounted, demeaned, and actually were publicly demeaned by the superintendent. Um, in other words, what they felt was nobody knew about them. And people were out there finding another program, claiming that they're no good. Um, and I'm sure there are kids that aren't succeeding, aren't doing well. But when, when a group of, of young people from a school are excited about themselves and excited about what they're going, and, and I, I observe this, and the teachers and the staff working together, and all of a sudden it goes completely unrecognized, just like the robotics thing, completely unrecognized. Um, they, uh, they had enough, uh, they were, they had, their, their staff and themselves had given them enough confidence that they walked down to the school board several times at their meetings when the board was portending to um, be contemplating what was clearly already a preordained contract or solution through the external management group that's called IDEA. And they just felt ignored and left out and gave voice to it. And that their voice rising actually got media attention and actually, I think, nurtured the parents and the, and the other students who also wanted to have their voice heard. Now, for me personally, I think um, what, I was able, what I'm able to say is the people who are giving voice aren't whining, which is the old paradigm. These are people who are giving voice because they're not being understood and they're not being listened to and they're contributing and they're growing. I can give voice to observing that. 
Now you say you saw the youth group, uh, the youth, come to several board of trustee meetings mm -hmm. in which uh, external management idea was discussed. Uh -huh. Tell me about what you observed among the board of trustees uh, in response to those youth coming to the meetings. Well, this was this was the the benchmark. This was the milestone for me personally because I had spent a lot of time in encouraging, exhorting, and participating. The, the the they were blank. The trustees. The trustees were blank, and even before the meeting, I heard one board member when the students were out rallying and, and just doing rally stuff, you know, signs and we're here and nor normal rally stuff. And this board member stood next to me, and she, they said, uh, "Where are they from?" And I said, "Well, they're from Eastside Memorial at Johnston." And she said, no. I said, yeah. No, they, no that's good. And I said, they've changed. She says, no, that can't be. It's the same demographic. Completely clueless about what I had experienced and actually denied wanting to even know about it. And then subsequently to that, uh, students would tell me that one of the other board members said, um, you guys got letter jackets? I, I didn't know you had letter jackets. So students wearing a letter jacket, which I've seen hundreds of them, or lots, the board member had no clue about it. Didn't know they had letter jackets. Huge disconnect, huge. And um, not only disconnected, but damaging to the kids. And, and to anybody who put a lot of time and energy, eventually you see that your time and energy isn't recognized or even known about. And it's all in the, it's all in the context of actually doing better. And it's not recognized. And I've come to speculate it doesn't want to be by downtown. So tell me more about the consequence of that disconnect between downtown and what's going on at the ground level. Uh, fear. Huge fear level throughout the system. Uh, I spend time talking to people in a variety of the schools, so I'm sure it's not everywhere, but it's most places. So um, the uh, there's it, it discon uh, the disconnectedness, the lack of trust, basically lack of trust, and lack of authentic leadership by the people who have the most influence, which in this case would be the school board as well as the superintendent, um, you end up constantly having problems. And because uh, the real solutions are close to the ground. Uh, people downtown, I believe, um, have been persuaded to control and dictate, not to lead and power and motivate. And that persuasion probably comes from a small group of people in Austin. But um, for me personally, I see it as a legacy of, uh, of uh, 1928 city plan that basically forced people of color, Negroes, uh, to East Austin, perpetuated that, accentuated that, and people have been fighting back against that through and then we used busing, which was a community destroyer in many cases. Some cases it was okay, but busing was a community destroyer. And so we have in, been in a vicious cycle for decades of um, having people in power tell other people or bring to people a program, go buy it in California, throw it in at the campus, uh, go buy it from down south of the valley and throw it in at a campus. That that process doesn't bear fruit in the long run, and it's just, it's actually destructive now. It's actually added to the legacy of segregation that the city's trying to overcome. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>